Right, um, we're going to do some things this morning, <coughs> particularly since we're live streamed for the EI website. So straighten your ties and, and your collars. <laughs> Make sure there isn't any stray hair knocking about all over the place. Anyway, um, particular pleasure actually this morning. In fact, it is a real treat to have two people who are really at the edge of their game on the top of their game in terms of their, their subjects and what they're going to talk about. Um, we've got Susan Robinson from the University of Cambridge and Alain Rochin from the University of Rio de Janeiro, currently at Oxford, I think, uh, as a secondment, I think. Yeah. yeah. And Martin and I and Nicola had particular pleasure of meeting them last night for in-depth <laughs> conversations. It was like the continuation of this seminar on steroids, as I used the phrase yesterday. <laughs> it was a really good conversation. Um, this is really about the kind of wider framework in which education takes place. Um, and we're going to start with Susan. Susan's a professor of sociology at educa of education at the University of Cambridge, a, a close critical friend of Education International. And I am personally, and I know everyone in the room will be delighted to know that she's going to take over as dean of the faculty of the University of Cambridge, the faculty of education which is great as far as I'm concerned. I've worked with the uh, University of Cambridge faculty for a long time personally. Susan is exactly what they need. Um, so without more ado, Susan, um, 20 minutes. <coughs> uh, looking forward to it. So thank you very much. Uh, I hope the faculty will be as impressed as you are before I've even started. Um, they, they might uh, have decided I'm not quite what they want. Um, but. Uh, let me just begin by uh, also thanking people in the room, particularly uh, Louise, who's nursed me through this project and always made the work that I'm working on actually so much better, um, in part because you're um, almost a bit more specialist than me and you follow uh, the trade negotiations in a great deal of detail, so I particularly want to thank you. Um, but also to EI for commissioning this piece of work. Um, you'll find uh, as a version out there which has got the red dot so you can't touch it, but uh, it's, it's a long, quite a long document. Um, and it's not that it, to some extent we, what, what educators need to know about global trade deals. But in a sense, it, it ends up being a story, if you're going to do this kind of work well enough, it ends up being a story about the general conditions that we're facing in education and particularly around privatisation. So I think the bigger message that I'd like to communicate to all of you in the room today, which is you'll always have to take uh, a message back to uh, the rank and file, is that actually, uh, if we let privatisation continue in, in, in probably, it's not just a drift, it's quite a tsunami, although there's kind of checks and balances, cat and mouse games being played and so on. But essentially you'll begin to see that that's what is at stake. Actually, what is absolutely at stake in the, the current global trade deals is that where we are, it, is essentially, um, and the degrees of liberalisation will not just be locked in, but there's no reversing in the direction of um, erasing that level of liberalisation of the sector. The only trajectory is a trajectory toward more liberalisation, unless you actually happen to be one of those education systems that, uh, and I don't believe there is one that actually exists. Uh, it's in that world called utopia, uh, which was being <laughs> discussed uh, at one end of the corner. We, it doesn't exist anymore. In other words, um, operating with market forces, a la choice and so on, that actually counts as now being uh, a, a sector, an education sector that's operating rather like a market. So you can see the stakes are incredibly high and essentially there are a number of things I'll argue that begin to follow from that. So what do we all need to know about global trade deals? Uh, I'll say something just quickly about the expansion of market-like and 
for profit activity. So those two things, one essentially, and you make the distinction, and I can hear that in your discussions, a distinction that Stephen Ball has actually made, which is the privatisation in, in other words, new public management, choice, competition and so on. Um, and then privatisation of, which essentially would be where we see significant uh, aspects of education. Bridge International Academy would be one example, but you could look at um, uh, Kaplan, Laureate, uh, many of the big providers in higher education, Croton, yep. which has just made another Brazilian company. Uh, it's the largest education company in the world. Uh, it currently only trades in Brazil at the moment, but under these trade agreements and the and Brazil I think is probably likely in the TPP, um, then essentially there's no stopping the ways in which those companies not only can function but can expand across the, the member states uh, of the particular uh, trade deal that they're actually in. Um, so I'll say something about GATS because this becomes important uh, only because some of the uh, articles then become some of the articles that also frame up um, what is also in these current trade deals. Um, and just also to say that one of the things about the GATS negotiations, which is the General Agreement on Trade in Services, uh, it was controversial when it was launched in 1999-2000 uh, under the, well, the WTO, which was the uh, World Trade Organization. So it was hugely controversial. It was dogged. The negotiations were confronted at every turn by contestation so that by around 2005, in, in a sense, many of those negotiations stalled. And the problem here essentially is that many of the activists and protesters thought that they'd pretty much won the day. Okay? But that has not been the story. And where these corporations particularly, and there's a, quite a long list you can see, the, uh, the Coalition for Public Services in the United States, and, you, and you'll see now um, typical suspects there, Facebook, Google, all of these are all lined up on that side. But you'll get the European Services Forum and you can run down that list of um, actors, um, corporations essentially, who are looking to open up services sectors and in our case we're particularly interested in, in education. So it's described as a game of cat and mouse. Okay, so where we think we've won something, essentially they move to a different uh, a different level, a different scale, and begin to unravel as they did with the uh, Directive on Services at the European level in 2006. Okay? So it's, these corporations are putting pressure in places uh, where we think, uh, or where we're not looking actually, um, and where we actually think we've um, fought the battle, won the day, and essentially we now know that the game is back on again. Um, what that meant was huge numbers of preferential trade agreements and we've in the report look at what can we learn from those preferential trade agreements and particularly where there are disputes and we can actually see for instance and I'll give you one uh, concrete example um, the ACMIA which is a health provider operating in uh, Slovakia Slovakia decides it wants to return its health system to uh, national oversight. Uh, the Slovakian government had to pay something in order in the order of uh, a quarter of a billion or a third of a billion back or to that company um, for uh, losses in services into the future. And that's the kind of story that's uh, what they're trying to do is lock in their right to trade in perpetuity in the sector. And if you want to change those rules, in other words, uh, move those providers out of the sector, essentially you're, you're being then asked to pay uh, actually monies into the future for lost services and they'll take those disputes to the dispute settlement uh, panels and typically uh, they win those panels because the lawyers are on their side and the lawyers are actually typically uh, quite well aligned uh, with them. So this is this is basically your future has been captured by the corporations um, and they are playing actually with this idea of locking in the future. So then we'll go just very quickly to uh, kind of the, not the detail of these trade agreements. Uh, they are written in legalese which makes it very, very difficult for uh, any of us uh, to even understand quite, you know, I mean, how do you talk about education in a classroom of a child? 
and most favoured nation or consumption abroad. These are two different languages. I mean, one's like a language from Mars when you're an educator, and the other one's actually about the education of the future of a child that the parent and you and the nation potentially care about. Uh, nevertheless, it is this kind of language that's actually being used to draw education in. In the longer report, uh, I make a case for uh, the sustainable development goals. In other words, if we're serious about the sustainable development goals, then fundamentally uh, the trade deals are not going to deliver um, anything uh, like uh, being close to uh, realising those sustainable development goals. And fundamentally the reason is that uh, the trade negotiators are trying to lock in a particular kind of future and make sure that the politicians can't get their hands on maybe they're voted in democratically, can't get their hands on reversing those things. Um, and yet my argument would be that we absolutely need policy levers. We need to be able to make policy and uh, citizens need to be able to vote for particular policies. So if, if basically the economy is off limits to normal political debate and decision making, this actually represents, a, a, in fact, a, a disaster for democracy. Um, so I'll just quickly then finish with some reasons to, s 10 reasons to say no. I'm sure we could have found more, but these seem to me to be the compelling ones. If you look at the expansion of education services, uh, just a couple of simple facts uh, in Australia, um, England to New Zealand as well. Um, for Australia, it's they, the trade in education service is the fourth largest GDP generator, just behind the trade in uh, iron ore. Now that is massive. Okay? So you can see both governments and their allied corporations uh, that are setting out to become services economies actually have services sectors like education in their sites. Okay? It's <coughs> as simple as that. Uh, finance, health is included here, um, the, the range of services that might even include tourism. But essentially this service which we regard as not just a public good but actually a societal good is actually increasingly being regarded as uh, a commodity to be traded uh, particularly across borders. Okay. Um, so the rise and the rise of uh, services sectors uh, that, that uh, and if we look at the TISA, so one of the big agreements is the trade in uh, services agreement, so it's the supposed uh, friends of services, you can guess who are in there. Unfortunately, my own um, home country, Australia, New Zealand, so all of the big countries that trade um, moving international students, companies, uh, uh, for example, um, into these are uh, recruiters of students who then do a foundation year, perhaps on a university campus, and then go through and so on. So all kinds of education services in their textbooks, uh, you name it, it's, it's a massive thing. Now the bit that is crucial for us to understand here in the GATS agreement, the General Agreement on Trade and Services, which was uh, launched as part of the World Trade Organization, is if you could show that the service was supplied uh, in the exercise of governmental authority, perhaps the army or something like that, but also education, but is supplied neither on a commercial basis um, and nor in competition um, with any one or more service provider, would be able to be exempt. Okay? So that's the condition for the exemption for a sector like education. But what we know is not only has there been significant amount of uh, you know, competition injected into the system so that essentially the education system's kind of DNA now is kind of wired up to operate much more like a competitive market. Um, but we see, particularly if we look at the case of England, um, essentially there's uh, full fees, we've now let in commercial for-profit companies, the list is of alternate providers is not only growing but very, very long now. Uh, I just have seen the latest list in the, for the higher education sector. Um, and these are 
essentially providers of education services for profit, um, selling degrees. Um, and just an astonishing figure that I saw, um, and again, um, thinking about who then goes to some of these uh, alternate providers that are enabled in as part of this more greater kind of level of competition, it, they're black ethnic minorities. Okay? So they're buying largely in the case of the UK, they pay 6000 for a pretty dodgy law degree that they will never, ever, ever be able to translate into getting a job in the law area. Okay? So there's a kind of exploitation that then is going on amongst particular uh, groups who are aspirational. Um, they actually happen to be young women, largely, in going into business and law. Um, but they, as in the United States, so too in the UK, these uh, individuals who are being sold often under kind of pressure tactic situations, um, a degree um, from a, a not a, at all a reputation or a, 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 an institution with a particularly high reputation. So, so that's sort of uh, the game that's actually at work. So I'll move on, but just on this side you can see, I mean, this is the so-called uh, different modes and it's interesting to look at how alien that language uh, means or, or looks to us you know perhaps companies moving across the border or companies being able to set up uh, let's say bridge international academies can set up in uh, Uganda um, Kenya other places um, and not be challenged because essentially in that case were it to be the case they're in a trade agreement uh, there would be no basis for them to be able to challenge um, what would be called foreign direct investment. So when the GATS negotiations bro broke down, essentially uh, what happened is that many of these corporations um, and nations actually went in and negotiated uh, uh, preferential trade agreements. So these are largely bilateral agreements. Um, and what the report does is actually look at what we can learn from uh, not only these agreements, but the different uh, disputes and, and so on. And we document a number of cases uh, in there which are actually well worth uh, uh, looking at. Um, but what we also can see is that the, uh, the numbers rose quite dramatically. Um, but you can, you can also appreciate if you can gather up a bunch of countries rather than do one-on-one -on -one bilateral uh, negotiations, this is actually a, a kind of a more efficient shopping um, expedition, if you like. So bringing more countries into uh, a trade deal rather than, um, let's say, Europe uh, negotiating with one other country, perhaps Korea, China, and so on. So that's been the pressure and the aim of the what we're calling the, the mega trade uh, deals that are actually on the table. Uh, those cases in these preferential trade agreements, as I mentioned earlier, have largely been settled in favour of the corporations in the dispute settlement mechanisms. Um, they are hugely controversial. They, uh, the Commission, for example, when its tr Department for Trade has been negotiating the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, which is the one Europe with Canada, uh, and the uh, the, the TTIP um, negotiations. Um, this is, this is the bit that uh, the protesters who have actually gotten organised um, have been contesting uh, most, uh, most ferociously. Um, and while there's been a change in name um, of this dispute settlement mechanism, um, in essence most of the watchers basically say it's doing pretty much the same kind of thing. Uh, it favours the foreign investors uh, as opposed to local investors, uh, but you and I might actually say whether it's foreign or local it doesn't matter, they actually shouldn't be investing and be supported to invest under any circumstances like that in education in ways that are actually going to lock them in. Um, so. The trade agreements, what the report does is it goes through in quite a lot of detail into the trans uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the US was in there and has backed out, but in essence the US's fingerprints are on that agreement in a very significant way, even if they're currently not really in there for the moment. The second one is the Comprehensive Economic Trade Agreement, the Trade and Services Agreement, which essentially is simply on services, um, and the Trans-Pacific, um, Transatlantic um, uh, investment partnership, um, which is the one that's still kind of ongoing um, at the moment. Um, the teaser is also ongoing at the moment as well. 
Um, but let me just point out a couple of things that, uh, that, that we should know about them. In essence, these negotiations have been conducted in secret. Um, perhaps the uh, TTIP, there's been uh, some effort to open that out so it's not completely like that. Um, but we get to know it through WikiLeaks. I mean, this is hardly democracy, and it's hardly what we would actually want um, as uh, some kind of uh, mechanism that is actually thinking about trading with our children's futures. It's trading our children's futures um, in a very specific way. So. Education is included. Uh, we can see that, um, even though when they're asked, they're, it's kind of ambiguous. Uh, but nevertheless, we can actually see under the TPP and CETA, um, it's included. And you've got to look in specific uh, places. It's included under investment. It's included in cross-border supply of services around labour, government procurement, and intellectual property. Um, I've made the point earlier about public utilities being exempted, but actually education cannot demonstrate that it's been exempted, which is actually why we actually need to absolutely make sure that were any of these to actually materialise as the CETA is currently um, on the books at the moment, um, then we've got to fight on our hands because ac ac actually education uh, is, um, is not in included, uh, is not excluded. There's no carve out and that's what we should be campaigning for. The government procurement market, um, I could give you very specific examples. If you look at uh, Canada, for example, or even indeed in Australia under the TPP, um, the uh, Australian Research Council, it's, all of its procurement contracts have to be advertised right across the partnership. There's a few exemptions, for example, Malaysian um, uh, textbooks in school, they're exempted. Um, and that actually brings us to a couple of things that I actually want to, to kind of highlight for us. Um, so again, forgive the language because this is very alien to, uh, alien to us as educators, but this is the language and let's just decode what it means. Standstill and upward ratchet means Essentially, where your system is in terms of its modes of regulation is where you get locked in. And then it's an upward or progressive movement away from that. So if you happen to be able to exempt yourself, uh, which I have no sense of which country could ever do that, um, from that point of where you are, it's an upward ratchet. That upward ratchet comes in this form, in what's called the negative list. You have to list all of those services in education that you actually want exempted. So you have to both be able to understand and know them now and list them now and anything else into the future. So let's imagine the world of MOOCs comes along. We couldn't have imagined it. We didn't even know the name of massive open online courses. But they would now be included because actually they are coming in as part of the future. We didn't list them, so now they are included in the upward ratchet mechanism. The dispute settlement mechanisms, which is the ISDS here, um, these, uh, these become the spaces now where uh, we know supposedly if cases are taken. Um, so let me just uh, begin to uh, finalise my comments then. Clearly, um, tariff barriers, are, uh, we don't have um, particular tariffs on it, sectors like education. So what will be at, at issue and at stake will be the non-tariff barriers. So here you can imagine um, oversights like quality assurance, uh, qualifications requirements for professionals, all of those uh, non-tariff barriers, for instance, um, the, uh, the, the cost maybe for entering into a sector and so on, these will all be uh, at issue and the words that are actually used is that the regulations shouldn't be too burdensome. In other words, uh, if for example, and we could take a bridge international academies, if it's being asked to uh, comply with um, having um, properly qualified labour to teach in their schools, that actually children actually follow the school curriculum and the textbooks, they could take a case and say that these are these requirements are too burdensome. Okay, so 
democratically elected politicians and a wider public who think that this is the set of conditions for delivering the kind of education that we actually want for children um, are essentially in dispute now that there would be a case taken where um, those regulations would be uh, at issue and you would have to begin the process of uh, removing them. So 10 reasons to say no. First, we should actually argue for um, a, a carve out. So there is no carve out of education at the moment. In other words, we actually must campaign and argue that education must not be included. The negative list actually locks in a neoliberal future. And if that's what we want, that's fine. But actually, many of us are horrified at that thought. Um, it's a, a neoliberalism actually promotes uh, individualism, exploitation of uh, individuals, I would say, particularly in education, of aspirations. Um, and we actually can see work of Piketty, for example, of uh, incredible spiralling upwards of uh, inequalities and the Gini coefficient in a place like the United States is <coughs> as high as it's ever been in the history of the United States. There's an inherent tension, I believe, between public services and neoliberal uh, trade deals. Uh, public services, they're societal goods, they aren't uh, there for um, anything other than serving the public and need to be protected. Some countries are pushing, like the United States, but indeed Australia and New Zealand, to be rule makers in this area, and the others are to be rule takers. Um, and that included the way the US was driving these trade deals, particularly the TPP, as a mechanism of foreign policy to isolate China. China at the moment, with its one belt, one road, has actually got a different strategy um, on the table, and that will be uh, potentially interesting for us to follow. Um, the liberalisation means reducing the non-tariff barriers. So, for example, labour standards. You can only take a case around labour standards if there's been an erosion of labour standards. So let me give you a very specific case. Uh, Laureate, uh, which is one of the very large, uh, it enrols about a million students internationally in about 27 countries, um, about 74 institutions. 4% of its labour... 4% is actually on some kind of tenure. Okay? The rest of the labour force servicing those students um, are paid on an hourly rate. You will have a doctorate and you'll be paid $5 an hour. Okay? Now, you cannot take a... Unless it goes to four, then you've got a case. And you can only advance that case, essentially, if your government is prepared to back that case. And most governments who are pushing for this are not going to do that. Who are included typically women, for example, and you could begin to see that more marginalised groups, uh, for example, are going to be included in that. Secrecy is anti-democratic, uh, and, and there's been the unconstitutional nature of the ratification. Uh, so essentially, uh, very specifically, if one person votes for the ratification, then the ratification goes through. And in the UK Parliament, for example, there's only one month that it's aired. It only needs one vote to vote for it, and the rest of the 99 votes, for example, that are opposed to it actually do not count. It closes down policy and political space, and that's the workings of a, a, a proper democracy. And it, the promise for growth for, through all for all for trade is not only just narrow, it's wrong. And we can actually see from the, um, the reviews of the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, we can actually see that all of the promises that were made around uh, the growth that would come from trade um, were not only uh, um, hugely exaggerated, uh, uh, but essentially it's, it, it's wrong. And we can actually see, and I've done some work around that, some of the uh, figures that the Commission actually use um, are simply huge exaggerations. Um, so I'll leave it there and we'll take questions uh, once um, you've presented. Okay. Um, I, I was going to take one or two questions now, Susan, okay. and then move on to Anna and then take you up the questions for Anna as well. Any, any questions? If, yes, right. Buenos días. En primer lugar, Susan, felicitarla. Me parece que ya han abordado un tema de importante trascendencia. De hecho, los sindicatos llevamos 
más que meses, años movilizándonos y haciendo protestas en contra de los acuerdos internacionales, el TTIP y el Z. Y coincido mucho en lo que has dicho sobre el secretismo en el que se han llevado a cabo todas las reuniones. De hecho, han sido de manera puntual cuando no han llegado información de cómo iba el curso de las negociaciones. ¿no? Yo creo que tenemos un reto por delante. La Internacional de la Educación ha hecho una campaña de denuncia y la Internacional de América Latina también me consta a la hora de, de eh, concebir la educación como un comercio educativo. Estamos en contra porque la educación es un derecho y viene recogido en la Declaración Universal de los Derechos Humanos. La educación no es una oferta, no es un servicio educativo, es un derecho que tienen pues, todas las personas ¿no? a la hora de recibirlo. Y, y simplemente era eh, preguntarte, Susan, por la experiencia que tienes, qué estrategias de futuro se plantean, porque el, el, el panorama que se nos avecina no es positivo. Es decir, el TTIP, el Z siguen formulando la educación como un servicio que se oferta y que baja la calidad de la educación. Entonces, ¿cuál es el futuro que tenemos hacia adelante? ¿Qué podemos hacer nosotros como sindicato? Porque tú lo has dicho, está todo en una burbuja secreta. No se sabe ahora mismo cómo va a afectar esos acuerdos internacionales. ¿no? Y de nuevo felicitarte porque es un tema que es verdad que hay que seguir trabajando. ¿no? Y nada, gracias. ¿Alguien más? I've got a question, actually, uh, Susan. I mean, thank you very, very much for that extremely succinct and uh, clear description. It, it does seem to me that actually uh, what you have in your ten reasons against, uh, that there's the basic framework and structure, I, I believe that those opposed need to actually articulate this as uh, a, an alternative negative vision of what society is and in do doing that mm -hmm. what we need to do is actually describe what we believe society to be. Yeah. I think services are fundamental, yeah. those kind of services you're talking about are fundamental to the nature of a democratic society in which you've said uh, and I, I think it is literally a, an opposition of, of the nature of society, an inclusive nature, as opposed to the privatization, which is the destruction and fragmentation, fragmentation of society. And I'd like to comment on that, but um, is there anyone else who wants to come in before I... Yeah, thank you. Okay, Susan. So thank you for those questions. I mean, I think the first one is just to... Uh, for us just to be aware of what's going on. Um, it's, I mean, ignorance isn't bliss, ignorance is. <laughs> the ignorance is simply that ignorance. And, um, and it's quite difficult actually to, you know, it's just not something you pick up and easily read in a newspaper because it's, uh, it's legal, it's necessarily complicated. Um, I mean, if I just told you how many thousands of pages are in the uh, TPP, the Trans-Pacific, it's something in the order of five and a half thousand pages. I mean, it's, these are a massive, massive kind of documents. So what that tells me is that actually all of the organisations uh, engaged with services, you know, need some a, n a number of people like myself and 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 so on, who are actually monitoring and, and providing updates. Um, the uh, European Universities Association, for example, has actually had a series of reports and things like that. Um, I'm actually heartened that across Europe, you know, Germany, Spain, and so on, um, actually even in my old city Bristol, there would be. Um, demonstrations against the TTIP, for example. Um, but it's, and, and we actually do have uh, ways of, you know, through WikiLeak and so on, exposing uh, these. So I think the first is for us to inform ourselves. The second uh, is to, through our education ministers, to uh, ad ad advance a, a, a critical attack on the Department of Trade, 
okay, which is actually negotiating this. And it's actually, uh, in the case of the European countries, it is the uh, DG, uh, uh, DG for Trade, Trade and Industry. They're actually negotiating it on our behalf. So who is it and making it actually potentially qu quite difficult? Um, then I think there is something about specifically campaigning on the uh, carving out education. Okay, so, um, but in stories that are, that are kind of, that make sense to parents and publics. Okay, um, did you know that? Okay, and I'm quite heartened by the stories that you've got out on the wall out there, where we actually put into everyday language what the implications are around things like trade in, in intellectual property and, and, and so on. Um, but then, you know, pulling it down to very <coughs> concrete things. Um, if we lock in, for example, the future like this, um, and my view is, how is it that politicians are asking, letting their hands be tied behind their back? In other words, having um, the economy put beyond politics. I mean, this is an extraordinary state of affairs, even for the economy, that always needs a state to, to actually stabilise it. If you think of the situation in 2008 and the banks are actually in meltdown. When a government, essentially, the political class has got its hands tied behind its backs, essentially that meltdown would just be an absolute um, volcanic meltdown. You know, there'd be no mechanism easy for a state to come in and resolve those kinds of issues. So I think this is deeply troubling and I think we need to put it um, in absolutely those terms um, about what that potential future uh, then. It's an irresponsible um, it's, it's, it's a series of irresponsible decisions about a future that actually needs uh, a high degree of openness. Um, and I, I would actually just ask you to kind of engage with the chapter on, I've tried to write the report in everyday language. Um, there's a, a chapter on the sustainable development goals, why and how it is that governments actually need um, policy making space and policy levers that they can actually um, press, manoeuvre, deliberate on um, with their publics in order to realise those. So knitting those things together, knitting a few stories together uh, in such a way that actually we've got a joined up account of the, the ongoing challenges, both the range and the extent of the, the challenges that the trade agreements present us with, but also the range and extent of the the challenges in terms of education, but what actually we need to do about it. Thank you very, very much. Indeed. We're going to have the opportunity. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Moira, um, can I just say we're running up against time a bit, and we do have the opportunity to continue that discussion if you're going to be in Susan's workshop. Yeah. I just want to say one thing. No, I think it's really important to say this. Uh, I, I, for Susan, that was, you know, we're all silent, not because we have no questions to ask. And we're all just blown <coughs> over by the gravity and the passion with which you have delivered your, your um, presentation. But I did follow this matter up about two years ago uh, um, in Ireland on, 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 in, in the context of the SG4, <coughs> not so much in the Irish teacher unions. But it was really interesting because. Um, the representative of Ireland at these talks was the Minister for Agriculture, <laughs> who had no interest in education. But he was there because agriculture is such a big part of the Irish economy and it's really important in the global trade talks, etc. And there was a complete, as you say, your language is extremely interesting, lockdown. He wasn't interested in talking about education as a tradable commodity or whatever. As a matter of fact, he didn't even understand where I was coming from in terms of my interest about education, you know, becoming um, a tradable commodity. So I think, you know, we really have to wake up to what's happening. And as you're saying, politicians are their hands are tied behind their back because even in their own way, they are actually quite ignorant mm -hmm. about. Well, that's my understanding anyway of the um, the Irish context. Even in their own way, they, they are actually don't understand of the bigger implications. And you gave the example of Slovakia. We also have the example of the health insurance in Netherlands, whereby the Netherlands government was forced to pay so many billions to a private company because of potential loss of profits. Yes. 
So I, I really do think that, um, you know, I mean, congratulations to, to EI once again for having these presentations, but I really do think we need a, a lot more guidance. It's almost like an audit. <coughs> in which countries, who's leading those talks? <coughs> How do people engage? What are the arguments that you use, et cetera? Because it, it really is really deeply challenging. And as a matter of fact, I have pursued these matters uh, with, with, the, with the Irish, with the Minister of Agriculture, and they said, well, we can't talk to you about education, because we're agriculture. Um, so you can't do anything. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right, okay. Um, <coughs> I'd like to introduce Alain Rochat, who's from the University of Rio de Janeiro. And, and Alain is going to take a, um, a look at an area which is adjacent, in a sense, to the area of, uh, of, of the private raid on the public good, as it were, which is about the nature of copyright itself, about protecting what is a public good in that sense, against those who actually do wish to uh, appropriate and attract to themselves uh, aspects of what everyone feels should be their own. I, I'm not going to put any more words into your talk now. You've got a uh, similar amount of time to, to, to Susan, and we'll, we'll um, take a couple of questions, but also uh, we'll continue the discussions in, in your parallel workshop as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for having me over. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Nicole, <laughs> especially, which, who I met last in the last uh, special council on copyright and related uh, rights at WIPO, or the World Intellectual Property Association, where most of the discussions on copyright happen in international terms. And locked in is the right word for cop to use for copyright as well. But not only locking in in education, but locking in in creation on anything. Yeah, ideally, originally, copyright uh, protected literary works right after and actually was created in England for the enhancement of learning. So we can't forget that. The first law of copyright actually had the purpose of giving exclusive rights to authors in order to um, instigate them to create more, to make those creations available, and at the very end, that will instigate and promote learning. So that was the original goal of copyright. Of course, that has changed, and that has changed a lot. So copyright now, like coming from 300 years, or yeah, 300 years now, copyright now is only a copyright instrument to lock in cultural creation, transactions, uh, uses, and going around. So this is a big problem. This is the major problem today in intellectual property. And that affects us as individuals and affect us as teachers very much so. And that's what we're going to see now. Uh, I do know, I'm aware that copyright usually only comes into our life uh, when we don't ask for license to download material, to share material, to upload material, to give material to our students, to actually have access to the material so we can actually keep learning in order to be able to be updated teachers. That's usually when we hear about copyright, about, oh, we shouldn't be doing that. So the word of should not be doing is the word that's being spread out by the copyright owners of copyright and putting copyright as something that for you to use you need first to get a license for so this is the message that's been going around and we've been hearing and this is the message that's actually been in place since the 90s more specifically basically since trips agreement since the trips agreement there was a robust change on the argument of protecting copyright as a protection for the authors or a means for the authors be able to survive off their creation and cultural activity for a means for copyright control of creativity. So nowadays, that's where we are at. Copyright is an, the major instrument to control creativity and the circulation and use of cultural goods in all sense. And as uh, copyright enter our classrooms and our activities in so many ways, because we as teachers are uh, both right, um, creators, users, and also mediators between prior existing works 
and new created works. We do all of those activities all at once. When we are in a classroom, when we prepare for a classroom, we certainly need access to a lot of material in order to create that course or that class or teach that class. But on the other, on, at the same time, when we are creating the class, we are creating a new material, which is also protected by copyright. So in that sense, we are authors at that point. But more than that, when we are in the classroom, when we are fostering our students to develop themselves, their talents, uh, we are actually promoting them as are potential writers, potential creators, potential musicians, and potential filmmakers. So we are at the same time doing the three parts of the copyright world. We are being users, creators, but also mediators. And we do that all the time. Even though we may not be aware of copyright rules whatsoever, we may not be aware of how much copyright enters in our life. In, in fact, copyright enters in our life almost the minute that we wake up and we will listen to a song, or we're going to read the newspaper, or on your way to work that you were just going through the news of the day. They're all copyright protected. Uh, and we face them all. In fact, they are part of our reality. But not only that, uh, the school itself, the space where education primarily formal education primarily happens, is a space also of integration. And part of the of the instruments that we have for integrating our students with the teachers and other uh, workers at school and also with the broader community is through cultural activities, be those uh, showing a film, be those bringing in traditional cultural expression into our school environment. So uh, teaching is not only in the classroom. The education has also a purpose, a broader purpose of integrating the students, the teachers, and the broader community. And we do that by using cultural expressions that are themselves protected by copyright. Uh, and if we see education as development, which I personally see, and I believe that's a view shared with all of us here, um, it is as being the basic of freedom in a, and horizontal dialogue, if we lock off culture and cultural expression from that freedom and that possibility, we are actually uh, becoming unable, we will become unable to actually do our jobs. Um, and finally, copyrights being promoted, um, those are the basic lines, copyrights always being understood as a means of ownership, but in fact, uh, historically, it is a means of balancing ownership and access because the end goal is actually promote the most widespread use and knowledge of that work. It's not simply ownership by ownership. It's ownership for promoting its spread out and access and new creations. Um, our reality, though, uh, is a bit different than what copyright should be. Um, we, when we are teaching, we do need, and I'm taking a lot of examples from Brazilian educational system, uh, we do need, and I believe everyone, adapt all the texts and general materials that we have to local realities, to our class, what our students need, what are the demands of those students, and to do that we need to adapt the pre-existing material. Um, so in the dynamics of teaching practices, we are using material, we are adapting them, we are creating them, but we are also sharing them, sharing them among ourselves, with our colleagues, with um, the people that we relate to while we are at work, at our unions and so on. Um, digital education will also bring two other issues, um, it made those, enhanced those issues, let's put it that way. First of all, it becomes more transnational. Uh, the more we're going to have online education, the more transnational it becomes. And the more transnational it becomes, the more copyright issues will come up as a wall for that transnationality. Uh, and I say that because it may not developing world countries, um, we are not yet so much bothered by copyright owners, but we're starting to be. For example, and give you a very clear example, uh, in Brazil, 
me and my colleagues and so on, we'll use materials that are not necessarily allowed under strict reading of the law. And nothing will happen. And nothing will happen simply because they are not really concerned about the teachers in the classroom yet. They are more concerned about the major uses of it. But once you put the course up online, that becomes a different thing. Then it attracts the attention of corporate owners. And then they are going to go after you and they're going to say you are pirate and therefore you're causing damage to the authors. And the authors are going to starve because you are teaching and using a material that you now have not been paid for. Well, I'll say what the authors have, is tar uh, have starved since the beginning of copyright law and that has not changed in 300 years. They still do not make money for survival except a few chosen ones that I use as trophies to show how copyright works. But other than that, we can say in all areas that copyright is the dominant force that only very few of them make enough money to survive. Uh, and that's still the reality. And uh, third, the third point here is that there's one part of copyright that is crucial, essential for our day-to-day -day lives, which are the limitations, which is what is not within the copyright protection. What are the uses that we can legally make of pre-existing works that are not protected. Those are considered user's rights. And those user's rights have been progressively diminished since the 90s, specifically since the 90s, and constantly being reduced, and being reduced and transformed from a right to something you have to pay for. It seems very similar to the educational in general. So the cultural activities are going the same way. They are going to be also locked in in a way that anything that, ha that can be done will need to be paid for prior to that. Um, not only that, but copyright causes another major problem, which I call the reference gap. It's a reference gap where our universities in developing countries do not have the money to have access to pay for the databases, to have access to the databases. And that means Latin America, that means Africa, that means Asia, uh, where most of the population lives. We do not have access to the same databases that we have here, for example, in Europe or in, Uni in the United States. And I say that for sure. One of the reasons why I'm here in England is so that I can have access to a huge lot of materials which I don't have in Brazil, so I can update myself and actually be part of the discussions. If I'm not updated, I can't be part of the discussion, discussing in equal terms. And that is just to show how much copyright barriers actually will increase inequality. Will increase inequality among countries, will increase inequality uh, among different groups. Therefore, the ones that can pay for, who have access to that material, who have a better knowledge, possibility of developing knowledge, who also have a better uh, uh, professional conditions. And that will reflect further on when they go for a job where they're better prepared, they're better read, they're better um, culturalized. Therefore, they're going to have more chances of getting a better job and get a better pay. So that affects um, discriminately uh, more um, minorities rather than the regular standard groups that are in the dominant level. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Um, in Brazil, most of the sharing uh, which we saw in the 2000s last decades, like Pirate Bay and all the sharing services, they were um, practiced by the upper middle class. And because of that, there was no lawsuit against them whatsoever. However, funk music, which basically created and made the favelas, suffers from accusations of plagiarism all the time, simply because they don't have the same social position to fight that back. That's just a, a, a clear, simple example. And consider I only have five minutes, I will 
fast a little bit the presentation we can move on on that and we are under threat education is also under threat through the copyright corporations and right holders and how do they do it they have a strong media partnership because media is also copyright protected they also have strong lobby power as we've seen in all other levels so combined with education lobbying well corporate education lobbying the copyright industry lobby is very, very strong. And also, they have big money. So they are everywhere. They can pay top dollars for all different sorts of lawyers and so on. And I can say that because I did work for um, a film company. Uh, I worked for Miramax and I worked for Lumiere, being the director for Latin America, before I went back to school to defend the public interest. And I did so because I could not sleep anymore. The contracts are just so hard, but it's like I can't write them. That's just too much. That was my limit on that. Uh, so I do know how they do and how they write the contracts and how they work. And they do have a strong rhetoric, and you're going to hear that a lot, and you hear that a lot, on the authors, and they convince the authors that any use that's not paid for will damage them. They are going to become less able to be free. They are not going to make less money because someone is using that film. I'm putting that film on my class so we can discuss it. So that producer will have less money. And we do. That's the romantic seduction. You're going to be the author. We're going to enlighten you. We're going to put you in the media. And you're going to get all the praise, but you're going to get no money whatsoever. All right? You're just going to get the praise, and this is good. That's fine for me. And most authors sat for that. They are fine, they are happy with that. Uh, and this is also another problem. Collective management organizations, and this is the major problem. They, rather than come and say, you user are a pirate, they change the arguments because they lost the argument, they lost that debate. And there's no other reason why Spotify came along just to substitute the free use. So they are changing uh, contractual like individual contractual for general licenses. And that's where collective managed organizations come about. They're going to come. They will set up in a country. They're going to say they are defending the authors of those countries, but whoever, who controls them? The big corporate, uh, copyright corporations. Those are the ones that tell them what to do, that set the rules. And they have membership control. The decision-making process are obscure. They are behind closed doors. The debate's always behind closed doors. There's a lack of transparency to the point that the world, uh, the WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, has set up rules for competition and transparency for collective management organizations. See, and that's a sign of how bad that is. And I was talking to some people from Finland, which has a collective management organization for educational materials. And it is the same problem that happens with music. It does happen also with uh, educational materials. And that will happen everywhere. Uh, we have only two minutes, and I'll be very quick. So the argument is all uses, any use shall be paid for. That's the right holder's idea of a balance. This is not balance at all. And because there are, um, let's go for the effect of it because that's the last two minutes. Because there are um, s instances where that's always been a free use. You always have it's a space of freedom for use and creation. This is space of freedom, I compare it very much to the environmental spaces where new the species breed, reproduce. Those areas are well preserved. Those are the marshes, the bays, the special areas. And education, I see the educational space as one of those special areas in culture. And it is one of those special areas because that's where you may develop your artistic talents. If you have on artistic talents, there's no other way to develop than practicing it, being exposed to it. You're never going to become a filmmaker if you're not a film buff. And we learned that from the very beginning. You're never going to learn how to write if you don't read. That's something I remember listening since I was like six or seven years old. And that is true. So if we don't preserve those spaces as the spaces of creating new authors, new works, uh, new thinking about culture, that's going to die. That's going to be locked in and more than locked in. That will be dependent on what these corporations want you to see, hear, read, 
and so on. Uh, what should we do then? So there is at the very end a substitution of access for licensing, which is a major problem, and also replacement of education as a right uh, to be made effective for education as a service to be offered. And the materials that go along with education, all the materials that we use, produce, or create, are also going to be seen as a service. And more important, we are going to be the creators of it, but we are not going to be the owners of it. We are not going to have control of it. What I've seen with Kron and other ones, they are going to now instigate, promote, show that teachers, they'll pay very little, but like create all the materials and transfer those rights to us. And they are going to all own all the courses, all the educational material being produced, and they're going to become also a copyright corporation, not only an educational corporation, but a copyright corporation as well. And that's coming along. And what we have to do. We need to act very urgently at the local level. And the biggest problem that I see on copyright conversations and debates in Brazil specifically, and I'm sure the rest of Latin America as well, most teachers are not aware of how much copyright impacts their life and how much copyright will impact their life, will actually impair them from doing their jobs completely. They are going to have to pay to actually teach <laughs> rather than anything else. And that's what we are seeing doing. Um, I believe there is one thing that we can do while there is time. We could, sorry, we should develop a code of best practice. And there are some code of best practice being developed already in the, U in the US, which is existing. And we could use that as a, as a means. And we must. Uh, make a decision of what uses are specifically should be completely free and you should defend that and what uses may be paid for uh, under a license there are uses that have to keep being free some others i admit that may be paid for for example if i'm going to actually make copies of the material and distribute to all my students of the entire text well that may be paid for that's different than me using that in the classroom parts of it and using that as examples uh, and also we must a clear recognition that education has a right and that uh, in order to make the educational right effective Copyright itself needs to be balanced, because if it's not balanced, we are not going to be able to promote education as a right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, I, I, there was a line you used, you used it at the end that was also in your slides, which is copyright is a balance of ownership and access. It seems to me the fundamental principle as how we determine that was illuminating. But both, both your presentations were immensely illuminating. Um, uh, Nicola has asked me to remind you that you can sign up for more information um, about EI's work outside on the collaboration wall. Uh, and Louise, you have the trade briefs. So yeah, they are on the website. Yeah. And they are the one that you can send. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. <coughs> We are very regularly updating the education and, and trade brief, uh, which are available on the EI website uh, and the world of education and the brief policy brief section of this course. Okay. And, uh, and if you have any questions, of course, you can always Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think. Just one question, a couple of questions, uh, briefly. Um, I think it's been, you know, a very tight constriction on what have been really deep presentations, but I think we should, we should have an opportunity for a general question in this group meeting. Anyone to ask? Yes. The, yeah. Il y a une question qui n'est pas apparue dans, dans votre présentation, c'est celle de, du rapport entre les droits d'auteur et l'enseignement à distance. Je donne le même cours que je donne en fait à, à l'université, euh, je le donne aussi à distance pour certains étudiants. Et dans la plateforme d'enseignement à distance, j'ai signé un papier disant que je leur, transfère, je, je leur transférais les droits de ce cours-là. Donc, normalement, si je suivais ce que j'avais signé, je n'aurais plus le droit d'enseigner le cours que je dois normalement enseigner à mes étudiants en classe. Et il me semble que c'est une procédure standard. J'ai signé le papier, mais je savais que je n'allais pas respecter ça. 
Et bon, je n'ai pas vraiment protesté. Mais ça m'a posé un petit problème. Et je me demande s'il ne faut pas peut-être insister sur ce point-là. Parce que c'est quelque chose qui va se développer. On va mettre des cours en ligne. Et ça va... On va transférer les droits de ces cours-là. Et on aura plus de cours. Merci. Ah, thank you. For, well, yeah, okay. yeah, really interesting two presentations, and it's interesting how you both talked about the, the run of the service economy and what that's doing to all of us. Um, I'm interested in particular in indigenous people and how they respond to the question of copyright, copyright given that having lived in New Zealand for many years, Māori have had some of their intellectual property uplifted by people in other parts of the world, namely England and America, and have found that delivered back to them that they don't own their own culture. If you could just comment on that. Sure, sure, sure. All right, um, thank you for your question. I think that is one of, sure, was the last part of what I said, which basically the new uh, teaching organizations, which are teaching corporations what they're gonna do. They, they're willing to become corporate owners of what we produce. And not only that, but right now, they still defend opening limitations that for you to make your course, you can use all different parts of materials and so on. But once you, the course is done, they are going to be the owners of it. And eventually, when they have enough course under the belt, then they're going to go against the limitations, meaning that you're not going to be able to use what you produce any longer. Yes, that's the cycle that's happening. This is what's going on. This is how uh, it's moving towards. There are no, if, so right now what we have to do is fight for limitations. There are two things that I suggest to my colleagues what, well at university. One of them is watch out what you sign because the, it's written in legalese and it's usually long. It's usually um, has a lot of technical terms which you'd need to have a specific lawyer to read about it and understand it. And those lawyers are very few and expensive. Therefore, you're just lucky. Okay, I'm just gonna sign it off and you go on. It's the same thing that happens when we publish works. We send to editors and stuff and we have to s give all our rights for free. And that's gonna happen the same things with entire courses. And I think the distance education is under threat already from the very beginning because of copyright. So I think you're right, and that's one of the reasons why we must act. And there's another problem with the distance education because, well, unless we're going to have to produce every time the same course over and over again, it should be a built-on possibility where I can use some materials. You can use that course and we can adapt, especially countries that are in same regions and same position, have some of the same problems. There's no reason to duplicate those materials. There is, however, one little slide of hope, which was, for example, the Marrakesh Treaty, which treated for was a treaty that obliged a limitation for access to the blind, so or the visually impaired. That's a mandatory limitation all over the world. So what that will allow for, that will allow for when I make in Brazil, for example, a work that will be available for the visually impaired, I can exchange that with Mozambique or with Angola and Portugal without having to produce them having to produce it all over again. And I think that's what we should fight for in terms of education. And that is now at WIPO's table during the, this next two years. And most of the developing countries' representatives were just quiet about it, were very unknowledgeable, unworried about it. They were unconcerned about education, probably because of the same reason why you said, well, that's not really what I'm here about, or I work for film, or I work for that, and I'm not really concerned about education. I think it's our job when we go back to our country to actually harass the representatives to actually do their work, which that's what they should do. In terms of the indigenous people, what I see happen is basically uh, what's been happening for, at least in Latin America, for 500 years, uh, basically being ripped off completely of all the expressions and now the limit now are the cultural expressions and we label them as traditional cultural expressions and there are two ways now it's been discussed for so many years at white point there's no treaty whatsoever on that uh, but what I see happen and that happens a lot in Brazil happens a lot of music that, okay which is people go to that region they know what people are doing understand what they are doing replicate it and call it authorship, call it their authorship, and then they register as a copyright, and that becomes theirs. And not only that, but they stop the people from using it. 
And that's, you know, that's the next step over. So it is very serious and it's not about to end. Okay. Definitely. And there was the only actual